Hello guys, this is the ASMR Medic. Uh, it's the third one of these videos looking at different OSCE examinations. Um, this time we're going to look at the respiratory examination for, for OSCEs. Um, I've gone through what OSCEs are in the past, so I won't repeat that. It's just a standard kind of clin clinical examination uh, testing that medical students and other uh, I guess nursing students as well go through. Um, and we, we, we get, we're, we're actually finishing off with probably the easiest one to conduct, which is the respiratory examination. Uh, just looking at kind of the general things you go through. This one's probably the easiest to remember, in my opinion. So you start with your standard introduction, general inspection. Then you move on to a, a close inspection of the thorax. You then palpate, percuss, and auscultate. Um, and that is, to me, pretty much it. And then you have this asking to sit forwards bit where you kind of you do the same thing on their back, the palpation, percussion, and auscultation. And then you do the standard completion of the examination. Um, as it says, respiratory examination frequently appears in OSCEs, just like cardiac examinations. You'll be expected to pick up the relevant clinical signs using your examination skills. This respiratory examination OSCE provides a step-by-step -step approach to examining the respiratory system with a video demonstration, which, as I said before, we're not going to go through, but I will link this website to you guys in the description if you want to look at it a bit deeper. So, as it says, it's got a bit of a mark scheme and uh, a summary. Well, there's actually one for paediatric respiratory examination, which is interesting. So the standard introduction, which is clearly wash your hands to the patient and the examiner. Show that you're doing it correctly and properly. You want to introduce yourself. So, hello, my name is the ASMR medic. I'm a second year medical student. And you want to confirm their, their details, the patient's details. So would you mind if I take your name and date of birth, please? They'll tell you. You can say thank you very much. Then you want to explain the examination. So in this case, you'd just be saying, I'm um, doing a, a simple clinical examination of your respiratory system, so, so, your, so your breathing, um, which will involve me just doing some, some simple touching, uh, listening and feeling of your chest and your back. Uh, does that, and then getting consent, general consent. So just say, does that sound okay with you? Um, if they say yes, then you can just continue. And given the non-invasiveness of all of these examinations to come um, in this in this little uh, little run through, you won't need to gain consent again. This is uh, implied consent for the rest of the examination. If you were doing anything a little bit more invasive, you may need to regain consent for that specific little part of the examination. So to begin with, you want to ask the, the patient to expose their chest for you. Um, that shouldn't be too awkward. It's really quite expected and the patient will expect it. You then want to position the patient at 45 degrees, usually um, on a reclining chair or on their hospital bed. And then you want to ask the patient if they're currently in any pain or discomfort. If they are, you want to go into a little bit more questioning. So, yes, I'm feeling some pain. And you want to say, uh, can you tell me a bit more about that? So, uh, kind of characterise the pain. Uh, what does it feel like? Is, is it a dull, aching pain? Or is it a stabbing, shooting pain? One that kind of maybe radiates out? Something like that. One that's kind of reflected into a different area. That sort of thing. Um, then ask some more general questions, such as uh, maybe... Does anything make it worse? When did when did it come on? Uh, does anything make it feel better? That sort of thing. Then you want to do a general inspection, um, and so this if it for the um, for the respiratory system is a bit longer than other ones, um, but it kind of brings in lots of different parts from uh, the cardiac exam as well. I suppose they're quite closely linked, the cardiac and respiratory exams. So this is actually starting off with age. So, uh, but a lot of these things you can kind of do in different uh, different orders, I suppose. Um, you should really have their age already, but I guess it's kind of synthesizing that information when you start the general inspection. So, are they old or are they young? If they're young, it's likely more likely to be asthma that you're looking at, or, or something like cystic fibrosis, more asthma than cystic fibrosis. Um, if they're older, you're thinking more COPD, that's chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, uh, or interstitial lung disease, ILD. So, or some sort of malignancy as well, potentially. And then you want to do more, what I, what I guess is more general inspections, so sort of end of the bed inspections. So that's looking for treatments or adjuncts around the bed. So are they on, on oxygen? Which again would, would uh, suggest COPD or IOD. Are there any inhalers or nebulizers around the bed? That which again suggests asthma or, or, or COPD. Are there any sputum pots? If there is, have a little look inside. Is there discoloration to the sputum? It's a frothiness of the sputum, that sort of thing. 
importantly, you want to look at the patient and see, I mean, do they look, do, firstly, do they look like they're in pain, which I guess you should have already assessed before in your introduction, but do they look like they're discomfort? Do they look like they're short of breath? They've got the tripod position, nasal flaring, pursed lips. Are they using their accessory uh, neck muscles? So that's the sternocleidomastoid muscles. Um, I've actually forgotten the other ones, the, the, the smaller muscles in the necks as well. If they're, if they're utilising those muscles to breathe, um, you know that they are in some respiratory distress. Um, you also want to look at their uh, intercostal muscle recession, which you should be able to see if their chest has been exposed at this point. Is the patient able to speak in full sentences, or they kind of stopping and breathing in between their sentences, kind of like that, um, or in between the words, which again suggests shortness of breath. And then kind of looking on their chest. Again, this is before you've really actually talked to the patient much. Do you see any scarring? And as you say, here it says in more details uh, in the close inspection of the thorax section below, so we'll kind of go into that later. Do they have any cyanosis? So whether that's um, a central cyanosis, that's in the lips and in the face or in the fingers. Uh, but again, we'll go into that in more detail later. Um, you want to look at the chest wall, are there any abnormalities or asymmetries? And the suggestion of maybe barrel chest, which is a, a, a common symptom of COPD. Cachexia, which is a very, very thin patient that uh, may show muscle wasting, which is suggestive of malignancy, cystic fibrosis or COPD. Are they coughing? Is it, and then there's a subclass of these sort of things as well. So is, is it a productive cough? cough? Uh, bronchiectasis, COPD if they're older, um, CF if they're younger. It's not always as cut and dry as this, but ge generally speaking, these are important to know. Or is it a dry cough, which is suggestive of uh, asthma if they're younger, or as it says, ILD if they're older. But again, it's not cut and dry. Do they have an expiratory wheeze? If they do, we're thinking asthma, COPD, bronchiectasis. Um, do they have strider on inspiration? Suggestive upper airway obstruction. Moving on to an inspection of the hands. If you see tar staining, that's one of those things that's not necessarily a symptom, but um, you see it and you think, okay, well, that's quite clear that they're a smoker. Maybe they have nicotine patches on their body somewhere. Again, suggestive of smoking. Um, if, they're, if you do confirm this, then you know that they have an increased risk of COPD and lung cancer, as well as lots of other different issues, you know cardiac problems as well. Do they have uh, finger clubbing? Nail clubbing, sorry. Um, we've talked about this in the past in the cardiac exam. It's again this sort of um, similarities between the cardiac and uh, respiratory exams. But clubbing, I'm trying to explain it too quickly. Uh, actually, if, do they have a picture? Maybe they do. It's easy to describe. Here we go. This is the uh, finger clubbing. Uh, what you're seeing in the main picture with the little red circle is um, a, a negative finding for clubbing, so you don't have clubbing. Uh, so you get this little bit in the middle, this sort of diamond shape, when you ask the patient to make this this, this shape with their, with their index fingers. This is known as Shamroth's window. Um, if they have this, they don't have clubbing. If they do, usually that, that window is, 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 is occluded. You can't see a little Shamroth window between the fingers. But also, yeah, I'd have to say it's quite clear if someone has clubbing. This is really to distinguish if, this, if you're not quite sure. If they have distinctive clubbing, you, you'll probably notice this kind of rounding of the fingernail quite clear on some people actually. You also want to look for peripheral cyanosis in the hands. This is not central cyanosis, peripheral cyanosis, um, which is shown by a bluish discoloration of the nails of the ends of the fingers, um, which suggests uh, an oxygen saturation of below 85%, which is pretty, pretty bad. You want to look for features of rheumatolo rheumatological disease, uh, such as joint swelling or tenderness, uh, suggesting rheumatological diseases such as um, rheumatoid arthritis, RA, which can be associated with uh, pleural effusions and pulmonary fibrosis. You want to look for skin changes as well, so if there's any bruising or thinning of the skin. And this can be associated with long-term steroid use, which is um, associated with conditions such as asthma and COPD. And with your hands, you want to assess their temperature. A reduction in temperature su suggests peripheral vasoconstriction, as well as in peripheral cyanosis, if that's true, or suggests of poor perfusion. Well, actually, they're kind of hand in hand, I suppose. You also want to palpate the pulse. Um, for rate of rhythms, so that's their um, their radial pulses. You want to assess their respiratory rate. Um, this is usually between twelve and uh, twelve and twenty. Sixteen is kind of the, the benchmark. Um, if they're above that, you know, th these are these are quite bad signs, especially and below as well. P 
causes paradoxes is a pulse wave, a pulse wave volume decrease when with inspiration, and it says that it's uh, uh, that it's associated with asthma and COPD. But th these things are associated with other conditions as well. So, for example, para pulses paradoxes. I I believe if someone thinks this is incorrect, please um, correct me in the comment section. But it's associated with um, uh, what's it called? You're stabbed in the chest, and you. Um, pneumothorax. It's like a collapsed lung, but we call it a pneumothorax. Um, do they have a fine tremor? So you ask them to put their hands out in front of them, sort of palms down. Can you see a, a sort of fine tremor in their hands? Um, and this is suggestive of beta-2 agonist use, so salbutamol. And if someone's using salbutamol, they usually, it's pretty clear that they've got asthma. Um, sometimes COPD, you can, you can be on salbutamol as well. Um, do they have flapping tremor? which is, you again, ask them to put their hands out in front of them. You want them to close their eyes and cock their wrists backwards so the, uh, so the tops of their hands are facing their face away and their palms are facing away from them. And if they have this kind of clear flapping sensation where their, their fingers and their hands are kind of uh, triggering forward in a kind of like shooting motion, um, that suggests of CO2 retention, um, which is uh, characterised in type 2 respiratory failure, such as COPD. You want to move on to their head and neck. So you look again, just like in cardiac conditions, you're looking for conjunctival pallor, ask them to lower their eyelid for themselves and have a little look for anemia. Horner's syndrome, so it's associated with ptosis of the eyes, a constrictive pupil, so meiosis, uh, and then central cy cyanosis, that's looking for blue discoloration of lips um, and the inferior aspect of the tongue. So ask them to open their mouth and raise their tongue to the roof of their mouth and look underneath their tongue for kind of again bluish discoloration. You also want to check their GVP, the jugular venous pressure. A raised GVP may indicate pulmonary hypertension or fluid overload, as well as a myriad of um, cardiac conditions. You want to, when you're checking for this, ensure that the patient is positioned at a 45 degree angle, like in this, in this picture below. You want to ask the patient to turn their head away from you, and you also want to kind of cock it at about a 30 degree angle as well, if it's not set on this bit. You want to, yeah, kind of facing away from you and raised head slightly. You then observe the neck for the JVP, which is located in line with the sternocleidomastoid muscle in the neck. You want to measure the JVP, and you do this in a number of centimetres measured vertically from the sternal angle to the upper border of the pulsation. Now we move on to a close inspection of the thorax. It should be quite easy if they've already exposed their chest for you. If not, ask them to do that. First of all, you're looking for scars. You can kind of do these in any, any kind of order, and really kind of, you don't have to go step by step with this, but it makes it easy to synthesize. So you're looking for scars, initially, maybe the small mid-axillary scars and the chest strains. Again, this is very, very similar to the cardiac examination where you're looking for things like anything near the, um, the sternum, which would possibly suggest a, um, a pacemaker, all these sort of things. So you have small um, mid-axillary scars, chest strains, going in from the side into the lung. Horizontal, horizontal postero lateral scars, which is a, a, a thoracotomy. Or low, low, be, low bectotomy. Looking for skin changes, maybe indicating recent or previous radiotherapy, erythema, or thickened skin around certain areas. You're also looking for asymmetry, which is a suggestion of major surgery. So you're thinking of new. I've actually not heard of this, but it's a it's a it's a, a, a surgery for, uh, for, for removal of cancer or uh, rib removal as well. Thoracoplasty. You're also looking for deformities, so again, we're talking about that barrel chest, which is, can be really obvious, actually, and that suggests of COPD. Okay, now we're moving into palpation, auscultation, and percussion, which are kind of the nice fun bits that we all think about when we're going into medicine. So, palpation. Palpation um, is the, uh, I'm trying to think, maybe have, a, maybe have a, a, yes, here you go, so it's where you kind of place your finger and you tap on the finger with a kind of a, a flicking sensation, a flicking motion, and you, you do need a bit of practice to get good at that. So first of all, at the tracheal position, ensure the patient's neck musculature is relaxed, so they're nice and relaxed in a 45 degree angle, chin slightly downwards, you want to dip the index finger into the, thora into the thorax beside the trachea, then gently apply side pressure to locate the trachea. Compare this space to the other side of the trachea using the same process. A difference in the amount of space between the sides suggests deviation. Uh, actually, this isn't 
this is nerve palpation, but this isn't, this isn't the tapping that I was talking about. This is known as um, yeah, well, tracheal dis um, tracheal. Uh, there's a name for it actually. It's tracheal displacement. Maybe they've said it like this, but also you can kind of get your index and thumb, place them either side of the trachea, and kind of move it from side to side. Um, and it does say it here because I was about to give a caveat to that that this is one of those situations where you might want to um, ask for um, ask for consent <laughs> that's the word <laughs> Can't believe I forgot. you might want to ask for consent again um, because it's quite uncomfortable as you kind of deviate the, the trick from side to side some people say that it, it, it feels like you're kind of choking them so just sort of warn them before you do that uh, you also usually won't be asked to do this anyway. With cricosternal distance, it's also a little bit of an uncomfortable one, especially if you're with people like people don't like touching other people touching their necks. Um, if you get three fingers, let me see actually what they say. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a proper example for it. So um, again, not commonly done in practice. Um, well, neither is the tracheal position one, but with cricosternal distance, measure the distance between the suprasternal notch, which is that kind of dip just above your um, your sternum your breastbone, the bit that people don't like touching usually, and the cricoid cartilage, which is the your Adam's apple, um, using your fingers. So usually you should be able to get three fingers in between. If you do it to yourself, usually slightly le less comfortable. Um, and usually, yeah, as it says, in normal healthy individuals, the distance should be about three to four fingers. If the distance is under three fingers, this could be a suggestion of l lung hyperinflation, which is where your lungs, as you can imagine, hyperinflate, which push pushes the top of your of top of your, your chest upwards shortening that crack start distance keep in mind that this distance is actually based on the patient's fingers not your own if their fingers are significantly different in size from your own it may be worth checking with their own fingers but again not commonly done in practice anyway you want to check for their apex beat which is at the uh, fifth intercostal space at the midclavicular line right ventricular heave is noted in core pulmonole right heart failure secondary to chronic hypoxic lung diseases such as COPD or ILD. Then you want to check for chest expansion. This is a really typical uh, one as well. Maybe they even put a picture in. That's the cracker center distance. This is the palpations for the fifth intercostal space for the apex beat. Yeah, and this is the kind of way you want to do this, this, this chest expansion. So place your hands on the patient's chest, as shown here, inferior to the nipples, so underneath the nipples. Wrap your fingers around either side of the chest, as if you're kind of, if you were strong enough, you could kind of pick up the patient from underneath their arms, so underneath the nipples. And bring your thumbs together to the midline, so that they are touching, not like here. That's after the patient's inspired, presumably. Ask the patient to take a deep breath. Observe the movement of your thumbs. They should move apart equally. If one of your thumb moves less than the other, this suggests reduced expansion on the side of lesser movement. Reduced expansion can be caused by a collapsed lung, uh, or pneumothorax, or pneumonia. Then you want to move on to percussion, and the technique for this is very important. Ah, silly me. <laughs> I actually mixed up percussion with palpation. Percussion is the tapping. I do apologise. Apologies for anyone who's already written a comment how stupid I've been there. Percussion is the tapping. This technique is very important. Place your non-dominant hand on the chest wall. For me, that's my left. Use your middle finger, which should overlie the area you want to percuss. So usually it's, usually it's horizontally between the ribs. With your dominant hand's middle finger, you want to strike the middle phalanx, which is that kind of middle bone. So you've got the top, the bottom, the, you've got the distal phalanx, you've got your um, proximal phalanx, and then in between them is your middle phalanx. And you want to strike that sort of nice kind of downward flicking motion making the noise, but you can't, you can't see it, of your non-dominant hand onto the middle finger. The striking finger should be removed quickly away, otherwise you'll muffle the resulting percussion note. So it's kind of a nice bang, bang, bang. Because of the following areas, comparing side to side in each go, so you don't want to go all the way down, you want to go from side to side. You want to look at the supraclavicular, which is the lung apices, so it's right at the top. The infraclavicular, so just below. The chest wall, three to four locations bilaterally, so on either side and the axilla, so it's on the sides, so the mid-axillary line. So you've got different types of percussion notes that you might hear. First is resonance, which is normal findings because of the nice amount of air that's flowing through. A dullness, which suggests that there's an increased tissue density, which could be a suggestion of 
consolidation or fluid tumour collapse potentially. A stony darkness, this is just of presence of a pleural effusion, so something outside of the lung. Or hyper resonant, so more resonant than you might expect. This is the opposite of darkness, suggesting of decreased tissue density, such as a pneumothorax, that's where lots of air has gone into that area of the lung um, due to um, a perforation of the um, of the pleura, usually. Okay, moving on to auscultation. This is the final part, really. Oh, actually, you do have to do the lymph, lymph nodes as well. But auscultation is using your stethoscope. Ask the patient to take a deep breath in and out through their mouth. Usually it's into the nose and out through the mouth, but I don't think it matters too, too greatly. First of all, you want to assess the quality of uh, 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 vesicular and then bronchial. So it's sort of harsh sounding, similar to auscultating over the trachea. Inspiration and expiration are equal, and there is a pause between, associated with, uh, which is associated with consultation. You want to assess volume. So quiet breath sounds and shows uh, reduced air entry, which is suggesting of, again, you've maybe got some consolidation in, in your lungs or collapse, potentially pleural effusion. To state whether the reduced breath sounds rather than reduced air entry when presenting back to the um, to the examiner. Are there any added sounds? So this is wheeze or coarse crackles or fine crackles. There's a few other types as well. These are associated with different pathologies. And then vocal resonance, which is usually quite fun to do. Um, so yeah, press your stethoscope if you're listening while they're doing this. Ask the patient to say, usually it's 99 um, repeatedly and auscultate the chest again. Increased volume over an area suggests increased tissue density, especially if there's dull percussion node over that same area. So it's kind of supportive evidence, which suggests again consolidation, potentially a tumor or globular collapse. Decreased volume over an area, especially if there's an associated dull percussion node, suggests fluid outside the lung, pleural effusion. And then finally, you're looking at the lymph nodes and the posterior chest. So ask them to sit forwards and from behind you want to kind of palpate around the neck. Firstly, anterior and posterior triangles, the supraclavicular um, region and the auxiliary region. These are looking for the kind of, in, um, kind of uh, inflamed lymph nodes. Okay. And then assess the posterior chest. You want to repeat the inspection, chest expansion, percussion, auscultation, everything we just went through on the other side of the chest. And again, this kind of wrapping around of your hands, as well as, I don't know if they show it. So they haven't actually showed it. But you've got this kind of, as if you're going to lift them up, they're kind of thumbs together, fingers wrapped around the axillary part of the body. And then you're looking for the expansion, equal expansion of your thumbs away from each other. Um, but also you do this kind of, imagine you're, 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 you're putting your hands sort of, Directly on top of their clip, on top of their um, um, their shoulder blade, and you're putting again your thumbs together, and then so your hands are kind of faced uh, vertically down over their over their um, shoulder blades and thumbs together, and as they take a deep breath in, you're again to be equal expansion away. Okay, and everything else as well, auscultation, uh, percussion, and such. You then want to examine their sacrum, so that's the base of the of the um, of the spine for edema. So if you kind of you should be able to do a bit of pitting there, uh, that suggests a fluid overload of core pulmonale. And then again, examine the legs for similar things. So it's pitting edema, as I said. Again, fluid overload or core pulmonale. Ex assess the calves for signs of deep thrombosis, deep vein thrombosis, which can be associated with um, pulmonary embolism as well. Um, inspect for evidence of erythema nodosum which is associated with sarco sarcoidosis. To complete the examination, as you always do, thank the patient for their time, um, wish them well, whatever. Again, clearly and obviously, wash your hands properly, and then summarise all of the findings that you've collected from the examination to the examiner. And then in terms of further investigations, as I said in the last video for cardiac examinations, you want to usually provide three um, suggestions of further assessments, so they've given you Looks like six um, uh, possible things, and, and the ones that you choose usually are related to the findings that you've gathered. So you're thinking, um, could be you want to check their oxygen saturation, which usually you probably would do if they've suffered, if they're somewhat breathless. You want to provide um, supplementary oxygen, depending on. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but that is very much depending. You may want to perform peak flow assessment. This is if asthmatic. 
We want to request the chest x-rays if any abnormalities were noted in the examination, so especially if they were, it seemed like there was any dull uh, percussions and things. So you're thinking if, if there really is any kind of um, consolidation or anything. You may want to take an arterial blood gas reading, or you may want to perform a full cardiovascular examination. So this was reviewed by Dr. Gareth Hines, and it was written, so a quick look, by... Again, Dr. Lewis Potter, who wrote the, um, who posted by, who posted the uh, cardiac examination. So, there it is, the respiratory examination. We've done all three now. I hope that you found these uh, useful. I hope you found them uh, informative. Once again, and I hope that you have a lovely rest of your day.